Today on Alex and Autos, we're out here in the forest taking a look at the 2015 Nissan Pathfinder. Now, it occurred to me that I haven't released a video on the Pathfinder since I first saw it at its launch event. Many of my viewers that have emailed me or asked me on Facebook.com slash Alex about three-row crossovers, especially large ones that are suitable for big families, have received an answer about the Nissan Pathfinder. Now, the Pathfinder is not necessarily my favorite vehicle in this segment, but it does have an awful lot of things going for it. We have a very large and very usable third-row seat, more cargo room in the back behind the third-row seat than something like a Toyota Highlander, and much more towing capacity than your average crossover. Up front, we have a version of Nissan's truck front end, which has this large chrome bar on either side of the central grille, large Nissan logo right in the middle. Very large headlamps that wrap around with excellent nighttime performance, optional fog lamps down at the bottom. We don't have front parking sensors available in the Pathfinder, but we do get Nissan's all-around camera system. It uses four cameras on the front, the sides, and the rear of the vehicle, and then a digital algorithm to stitch those images together to give you a bird's eye view of the vehicle as it's driving around. Now that's not standard on the Pathfinder, but it's definitely an option that I would get. The swoopy lines on the side of the Pathfinder belie the size of this vehicle. This is a very large three-row crossover at over 197 inches long. Despite some of the styling we have going on back here, we also have a relatively vertical rear glass. That means it's a lot more practical in the back than some of those more sloping entries. The way they accomplished that was by making the hatch wrap onto the body, giving the body a little bit more of an angle. This is a full 10 inches longer than a Kia Sorento, a full six inches longer than a Toyota Highlander. It's also six inches longer than a 2015 Honda Pilot and three inches longer than the new 2016 Honda Pilot. Now it is about six inches shorter than a Chevy Traverse and about seven inches shorter than a Chevy Tahoe, but it actually has about the same amount of room on the inside as the Tahoe. The reason for that, of course, is because the Tahoe has a much longer hood and this has a much longer body. A number of you asked in my preview video about the ground clearance on the Pathfinder. Nissan ranks it at seven inches, which is a little bit lower than some of the other entries in this segment. I actually measured 7.8 inches between the vehicle and the driveline components to the ground. However, this front air dam right here, which is rubbery and separate from the bumper, does drop to right about seven inches. So that's probably where the seven inch figure from Nissan comes from. If you did want to remove that air dam, you would get a little bit extra ground clearance, and there is a little bit more ground clearance, of course, in the critical areas on the vehicle. Out back, we have a tasteful amount of chrome. You can also see that this rear hatch is large. It's also relatively vertical, helping maximize that cargo area. We do have rear parking sensors on our particular model. They're kept nice and high and out of harm's way in minor accidents. For 2015, Nissan has apparently discontinued the Pathfinder Hybrid, leaving this 3.5 liter V6 engine to be the only drivetrain option. Now, if you do get the Infiniti version of this vehicle, the Infiniti QX60, you can still buy that hybrid drivetrain. The power figures come in at 260 horsepower and 240 pound-feet of torque. You'll notice that the horsepower figure is very similar to most of the competition, a little bit lower than some of them, but that torque figure is definitely lower than many of the vehicles in this segment. It's all down to the transmission, because this engine is mated only to a continuously variable transmission, or CVT. CVTs in general can't handle quite as much torque, although this vehicle does have a relatively high tow rating for this category. You can get an optional all-wheel drive system for $1,690, and that all-wheel drive system has an interesting twist, allowing you to fully lock the center coupling with the rotation of a dial on the cabin, sending 50% of the power to the front, 50% of the power to the rear. There are two major reasons that Nissan uses a CVT. The first, of course, is fuel economy, because the fuel economy ratings for a vehicle this size are actually quite good, and we have been averaging right around 21 and a half to 22 miles per gallon. Doesn't sound that impressive, but if you compare that to something like a Chevy Tahoe or a Chevy Traverse, this is excellent fuel economy. The other reason to use a CVT is that it improves drivability when you only have 260 horsepower under the hood, motivating a vehicle that can hold seven people and some additional luggage. You'll really notice the benefit of a CVT if you're climbing mountain highways, where this vehicle doesn't slow down quite as much as some of the competition. Now you get an awful lot of engine noise coming from the hood because the engine will rev way up, but it will still climb that hill a little bit more smoothly than some of the competition. If towing is your thing, then the Nissan Pathfinder will tow up to 5,000 pounds when properly equipped. That's quite a surprising number for a vehicle with a continuously variable transmission. It's all in the design of the transmission and the design of the vehicle that they've been able to give you this kind of towing capacity. Now, admittedly, as I'll talk about in the drive section, towing with the CVT is a little bit unusual, but this vehicle can certainly do it. 
Our model has the reasonably priced $400 hitch receiver and 7-pin wiring harness adapter. If you ever plan on towing with your vehicle, I strongly recommend getting the factory towing package because it's just easier to integrate in the vehicle and it probably will be less expensive in the long run. You get the standard integrated vehicle wiring harness so you don't have to cut any wiring harnesses yourselves and usually the factory hitch looks a lot better and just integrates nicer with the vehicle. Front seat comfort comes in at 9 out of 10 points. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column and a multi-way power driver's seat with a two-way adjustable lumbar support. Our particular model also has a two-position seat memory over there, and overall these seats rank towards the top of this category in overall comfort. Depending on your body shape, you may find the seats in the Buick Enclave to be a little bit more comfortable. They're a little bit wider, they're also a little bit softer padded. The Sorento and the Highlander also score incredibly well in this segment, but I think these seats are a slight notch above that, especially in the top end trims. When you're taking a look at three row crossovers, it's important to take a look at the combined legroom figure. That would be front row, second row, and third row all added together. The reason that combined number is important is because it's the key to inserting adults in all three seating positions of the vehicle. Many vehicles in this segment have more front legroom or more second row legroom than the Pathfinder, but the Pathfinder has the most combined legroom of most of the vehicles in this segment. I actually haven't found any vehicle in the segment so far with a higher combined legroom figure. Even something like a Chevy Tahoe or the Chevy Traverse, which are larger than this, have a slightly smaller combined legroom number. The second row seats move in a variety of different ways. They slide forward and backward like I showed you. This is now slid into the furthest forward position. They also recline with this lever on the side. They recline backwards right like that. And then they also go to a very upright position. They will also completely fold forward as you can see right there. If however we use this lever on the seat back right here, then the seat collapses in an entirely different way so that it moves forward to give you better access to the third row. Now we have a child seat on the 40% side of this 60-40 folding second row seat for a good reason. This seat does not move in the same way as this 60% side and it's important because it allows you to keep a child seat in that position, fully latched in, slide it all the way forward and still get in the third row. Now you'll notice we don't get quite as much movement as we get over here on the 60% side but the difference is only about that much. So we still get a very large opening to get access to this third row. I wouldn't call any third row exactly the lap of luxury, but the Pathfinder's third row is very large for this category, and the seat bottom cushion is a little bit higher off the floor than you'll find in many of them. It isn't as cramped back here as it is in the Toyota Highlander because we don't have three seats in the back. Now this bench seat isn't really that much narrower than the Highlander, it's just that Toyota had to put a third seat right here in the third row in order to still put seven people in the vehicle and use bucket seats in the middle. Passengers in the third row do get their own air vents on the side and dual cup holders on either side right on top of the wheel wells. And the interesting thing here is if I pull the second row seat all the way back in its tracks and then latch the seat back into place, my knees actually are touching the seat. However, I get an awful lot of room there in the second row. If I slide the seat forward to the same position I had it in before, where I said I had about three or four inches of leg room there and it was quite comfortable, then this seat gives me about two and a half to three inches of legroom right here in the third row as well. More importantly than any of that, however, is the headroom. I still have about an inch and a half to two inches of headroom in this third row. That means that me at six feet tall, I could sit in the front seat and then sit behind myself in the second row seat and then sit behind myself in the third row seat. You actually can put seven six foot tall people in the Nissan Pathfinder. I wouldn't call these two rear seats the most comfortable, but you can certainly do it for an hour or two if you needed. Your head's not touching anywhere. You can actually lean all the way back in the seat with your head on the headrest and still be relatively comfortable. That's very different than most of the three row vehicles in this segment, which have very compact third rows that are best suited to children or your mother-in-law. The big difference between this and the Chevy Traverse is that the Chevy Traverse prioritizes cargo room over third row room. So even though the Traverse is a little bit longer, we actually get more combined leg room in this particular model than in the Traverse, but it sacrifices some cargo room right back here. That means that behind this third row seat, you will find 16 cubic feet of cargo space. That's about the same as your average full-size sedan. You will find three cubic feet less in the Toyota Highlander, but about six cubic feet more in the Chevy Traverse. With the luggage in this position and the third row and that one second row seat folded, you can really see what kind of room we have back here. If I lift this cargo load floor, you'll actually find some additional cargo space right down here. That cargo slot is large enough that you can put a 24 inch roller bag in this position. Obviously you can't close the lid, but that gives you a general idea of the size. Our particular model has the optional Bose Acoustamass subwoofer on this side right here, and that does take up a little bit of cargo room under the load floor. 
If you need all that extra cargo room, the Bose subwoofer is easily removable from the cargo area and you get about this much space back. In case you're wondering, there is a spare tire and it is located right here under the cargo area. Taking a quick spin up front, we have height adjustable seat belts and two-way adjustable headrests for both the driver and the front passenger. Over on the doors, we have mostly soft touch plastics. We have a very large and softly padded armrest right there, some imitation wood trim right next to the door handle, and soft touch plastics most of the way around. Hard touch plastics lower near this storage bin and the speaker grill at the bottom of the door panel. Now, some people ask why I mentioned hard touch and soft touch plastics. What difference does it make? Well, in general, soft touch plastics look a little bit better. They also wear sometimes a little bit better. The hard plastics like we find right here on this dashboard sometimes can scratch a little bit more easily, and sometimes they also look a little bit less premium. This particular vehicle is one of the exceptions. This is hard touch plastic, so it doesn't feel as premium as some of the entries in this segment, but does have exactly the same texture as the soft touch plastics we find over there on the door. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, you can see this two-tone color scheme in our model a little bit more clearly, sort of taupe on top, and then this tan color below. We do have a center channel speaker in our model because we have the up-level sound system, and then this is where you'll find the optional touchscreen infotainment and navigation system. You'll notice that this infotainment and navigation system does not look and feel like the one that we recently saw in the Nissan Murano. That's because this is essentially the older generation Infiniti infotainment and navigation system. We still find it in a number of Infiniti models, but the latest Infiniti models use an entirely different system. This does combine a touchscreen system with a control knob right here in the center. We have an in-dash six disc optical disc player in our particular model. You'll find the direct access buttons to satellite radio, the disc or auxiliary input right there, AM, FM over here. You can touch the screen as well as use this control pad. So for instance, if we're on the settings screen here, you can actually touch a button right like that, or you can use this control knob or even the toggle switch on the steering wheel to control that screen. Below all of that in the dashboard, we have a standard three zone climate control system in every model of the Pathfinder. Continuing down, we have a very traditional shifter button right there on the front. Behind that, you'll notice that we have two 12 volt power outlets in this small storage bin right there. We have drive, low, and then overdrive off via this button right here on the side. Because this is a CVT, you can think of this sort of as low with this button and then lower with the L mode right down here. Heated seat switch is right over there because our model does not have the cooled seats. Two very large cup holders, easily able to accommodate the largest takeout drinks I was able to throw at it. And then right here, you will find the control for the all wheel drive system. The all-wheel drive system, as I said, has a lock mode, so if you want to lock it, we just rotate it on over to the lock mode. If you're in certain drive situations and going under a certain speed, it will lock the center coupling. This does not feel quite like a completely locked transfer case in a traditional four-wheel drive vehicle, but it's close. Auto allows the system to decide what is best for itself, and if you rotate it over to two-wheel drive mode, this vehicle will stay in front-wheel drive for the best fuel economy. We have a new hill descent button right over here. Moving behind that, we have a large and softly padded center armrest. It opens to reveal two tiers. The first tier has a cable cutout. You can see you can fit wallets and other smaller items right in there. Opening to the next tier, we have RCA jacks for auxiliary input. We have coin holders on the front. We have a 12 volt power outlet and a USB auxiliary input and an awful lot more storage space. Over on the driver's side, we have a four dial instrument cluster, large speedometer over on the right, tachometer on the left, with smaller fuel and temperature gauges below. Zooming in a little further to the center, we have a small monochromatic display for the transmission mode indicator and the odometer, and then a large color display for your trip computer. The buttons that control that multi-information display actually serve a split purpose. So this button module right here, this toggles up and down, clicks to enter, we have a back button and then a screen change button, controls not only this multi-information display, but also the infotainment display in the center of the dashboard. The multi-information display gives you status on your safety systems. We also get four-wheel drive status. At the top, you can see it's in auto. We can put it in two-wheel drive, or we can put it in lock. If we move on over, you can also get statistics. We have been averaging about 20.7 miles per gallon in this vehicle with a lot of idling during this photo shoot. You can also move on over and see the status of your four-wheel drive system, telling you where the power is going, front and rear. Another fuel economy screen that's just dedicated to fuel economy, vehicle warnings, and certain vehicle settings. This is where you use that little toggle switch to go down through these options and actually adjust certain vehicle settings. Zooming out to the steering wheel, we have essentially the same four-spoke steering wheel we find in a variety of different Nissan products. Same button bank I showed you earlier right over here. Dedicated volume up, down, source button, voice command button, phone hang-up button, and on this side we find the buttons for our cruise control system. Our model does have the keyless go, so we have a button right over there for that. The Pathfinder may be large, but it's surprisingly light for the overall size. This is significantly lighter than General Motors' full-size crossover vehicles. The low curb weight is obvious when we take a look at the acceleration figures in this vehicle. We ran from 0 to 60 in 7.1 seconds. That makes this significantly faster than most entries in the segment, even though we have that CVT and a little bit less torque than average under the hood. 
The only vehicles in this segment that will be significantly faster than this will be the Ford Flex with the all-wheel drive and turbo, the Ford Explorer with all-wheel drive and the turbo, and the V8 version of the Dodge Durango. That's pretty much it. Every other entry in this segment is either right about the same speed or actually slower. Now, due to the way CVTs behave, the Pathfinder sometimes can feel a little bit sluggish in comparison with something like a Toyota Highlander, but it actually will accelerate faster than it. It just has to do with the way that CVTs behave and how long sometimes it can take to change ratios from high ratios to low ratios and back again. On the flip side of that, of course, is the fuel economy, and I have been averaging 21 to 22 miles per gallon in this vehicle, which is excellent for a vehicle this size. That is about three miles per gallon better than I last received in a Buick Enclave. That's a significant difference when we're talking about fuel economy numbers that are down at this end of the scale. A two or three mile per gallon bump will impact your pocketbook considerably more at this end of the scale than say going from 40 to 42 miles per gallon. Nissan has tuned the Pathfinder to have a very soft and compliant suspension. It's most noticeable in the versions other than the Platinum trim. I give this 9 out of 10 points when it comes to the ride. It is supple, it is definitely comfy, but does impact handling just a little bit. Now, if you get the Platinum, then it is a little bit interesting because the suspension is still just about as soft as this, but you get much skinnier tires, and that does reduce the ride quality a little bit. When it comes to handling, I mean to give the Pathfinder 8 out of 10 points. It is kind of a mixed bag, however. True handling numbers are actually good in the Pathfinder. This does actually hold the road very well, but the stability control system is quite intrusive, and the vehicle feels a lot softer than the others. The softer suspension, more body roll, more tip and dive, and very light feeling steering with very little feedback drops this down to 8 out of 10 points. Now I say it's a bit of a mixed bag because when you take a look at the actual road holding numbers in the Pathfinder, this holds the road just about as well as a Mazda CX-9. But the CX-9 feels a little bit better, and the feel is all down to the way the stability control system interacts in the vehicle, the way the steering feels, and then of course the stiffer suspension over there in the Mazda, which gives you less body roll. But this doesn't actually go around the corners any slower than that Mazda. Thanks to the light curb weight and excellent brake tuning, braking distances were fairly short in this vehicle at 125 feet. It's quite impressive for this three-row crossover segment, and it is about the shortest that you'll find. The cabin noise score comes in at 9 out of 10 points because this interior rang in at 69 decibels, which makes this one of the quieter three-row crossovers available. The CVT in the Pathfinder really is a defining feature. Now, some will like it and some will not, but the CVT is what's responsible for that fast acceleration time, even though we don't have quite as much torque as we do in some of the competition and the excellent fuel economy numbers in this vehicle. The CVT also makes this a little bit better at hill climbing than your average through a crossover, especially when it's fully loaded, because this transmission always has the right ratio for you. When climbing a hill, you don't have that whole slow down, downshift, speed up, upshift thing going on. This vehicle just varies the ratio to give you whatever is required. Because this engine doesn't produce as much torque as some of the competition, however, we do have to rev this engine more to get the same out of it. So on steep uphill slopes, you will hear more of the engine, and you will hear that engine hanging out at a particular RPM for longer when you're going uphill. For 2015, Nissan has fiddled with this transmission, and they've actually given it imitation automatic transmission shifts. So this will attempt to imitate a stepped automatic transmission when you floor it. Now I mention that because zero to 60 times are actually about two tenths of a second slower when this transmission is imitating an automatic transmission because it's actually more efficient for this thing to operate like a CVT. That's the whole benefit of the CVT. You bring the engine up to its most efficient or its most powerful band, and then you just have it hang out there for your maximum fuel efficiency or your maximum acceleration. And so by programming this to imitate an automatic, it may feel more normal to some people, but it actually will give you worse performance. What makes towing with a CVT unusual is that the transmission is always varying the ratio, and that's not happening in an automatic transmission. In an automatic transmission, the transmission will stay in a particular gear until a different ratio is required. This transmission rarely stays at a single ratio. It's a strange feeling, but it is something you get used to. Your foot's on the accelerator pedal, and you tend to sort of move it around an awful lot, trying to figure out exactly where the pedal should be for the speed you want to go with the trailer attached. But after a while, it becomes more normal. The CVT gives you the same benefits when towing as when driving out on the open road. So we get improved fuel economy. We also get improved acceleration and improved hill climbing because this transmission can vary its ratio. When towing a 5,000 pound trailer up a hill, this vehicle feels like it's straining a little bit less than General Motors Lambda SUVs. Some of that, of course, has to do with the curb weight. The Chevy Traverse is a very heavy vehicle, but also it only has a six-speed automatic transmission. This doesn't feel quite as good, of course, as the Dodge Durango with its ZF 8-speed automatic transmission, but it's actually a little bit better than your average vehicle in this segment. Reasonable pricing has long been a Nissan selling point, and that continues for the 2015 model of the Pathfinder. 
Pricing starts at $29,950 for the base model. You can add all-wheel drive for $1,700. Now, just about $30,000 may sound a little expensive for a base model, but most of the competition is actually higher these days, and this is only $1,200 more expensive than the significantly smaller Kia Sorento with a four-cylinder engine and only five seats. The standard model does give you three-zone climate control, but some things are missing, like Bluetooth, the backup camera, keyless go, and the ability to add the towing package. All that happens in the next trim up at $32,810. I'd actually call that the realistic base price for this model. As with many of the competition, Nissan likes to bundle things into different trim levels rather than having a lot of standalone options out there. So if you want leather, that will set you back about $36,060. If you want navigation, the premium sound system, and the all-around camera system, that'll be $38,090. You also get some additional options in those packages, of course. $39,390 is the first model that has a panoramic sunroof. And if you want all the options, that would be the $41,410 Platinum model, which gets cooled seats in addition to heated seats and 20-inch wheels. Again, you can add all-wheel drive for just about $1,700. Obviously, previous generations of the Pathfinder were more off-road focused vehicles, but this Pathfinder gives you a locking center coupling, which does make it a little bit more capable than some. I wouldn't take this rock climbing or anything along those lines, but if you do live in an area where you frequently have to park off the pavement on a hillside like we're on right now, this will be a lot more capable in terms of climbing this hill than many of the other crossovers. I'll get in and show you. So, getting in, start the car up put the uh, four-wheel drive system into the lock mode. It is engaged now, and that helps us climb up this incline that we're on right here, which is leafy, grassy, dirty, etc. You can see there is still wheel slip, but it's doing it an awful lot better than something like a Highlander. Competition is obviously gonna be a little tricky because there are so many three-row crossovers out on the market, and they're more and more every year. As a result, I'm only going to talk about a few of them. First up, we have the Kia Sorento. It could be seen as the discount entry in this segment. Comparably equipped, it is about $1,200 less than this particular model, but the base price is significantly lower. And the reason for that is because the Sorento competes not just with the Pathfinder, but it also competes with Nissan's Rogue. It's actually sized somewhat in between the Rogue and the Pathfinder. Very much like Nissan's own Rogue, it is available either as a five or a seven passenger vehicle, and the seven passenger model is the one you'd compare with the Pathfinder. Top level versions of the Sorento are a little bit nicer on the inside. It is obviously a little bit fresher since it's a brand new 2016 model as well, but we don't have quite as much room, especially in the second and the third row in that vehicle. So if creature comforts and luxury features are important to you, the Sorento does very well for itself, especially in the front cabin area, but in the back, you'll find considerably more room in something like this. The Sorento does handle a little bit better, but that's mostly because it's lighter and smaller. Speaking of smaller, many people don't realize this, but the Toyota Highlander is not one of the larger vehicles in this segment. It's actually about half a foot shorter than this vehicle right here, and it really shows on the inside. We get significantly less cargo room behind the third row and significantly less room in that third row than we get in the Pathfinder. That's even taking into account the fact that the Highlander now has a three-passenger third row. The primary reason for the Highlander's three-passenger third row was that you can still have a seven-passenger version with bucket seats in the center. That's really what they've done here. And Nissan still gives you a bench seat in the center in all versions, and then we get that bench seat in the back. So the Highlander is trying to give you optimized front and second row comfort by sacrificing third row comfort. You really can't put three adults in that third row seat in the Highlander. But in this vehicle, you can put three adults in the second row and two adults in the third row relatively comfortably. Obviously, the people in the third row aren't gonna be quite as comfortable as the people in the second row, but this is one of the most comfortable third row options out there this side of a minivan. It's a little too early to tell how the 2016 Honda Pilot will really stack up against the Nissan Pathfinder. However, it's likely going to be one to $2,000 more expensive for a similarly configured vehicle. We have about the same kind of power under the hood, about the same kind of off-road ability, but that Pilot is still a little bit smaller. Even though the Pilot has grown for 2016, it's still about three inches shorter than this, and by all the initial measurements, it looks like it's gonna be a little bit more compact than that third row primarily. General Motors Lambda triplets are probably the most direct competition for the Pathfinder because they're priced about the same. That would be the Traverse, the Acadia, and the Enclave. All three of those vehicles are a little bit larger than the Pathfinder, but most of that additional room goes to the cargo area, not to the passenger area. It's really obvious when you take a look at the combined legroom figures. If you add up all three rows together, Together, this actually has a little bit more legroom total than any of those three vehicles. The biggest differences between the Pathfinder and General Motors Lambda triplets, however, really is handling and fuel economy. 
mostly because the Pathfinder is significantly lighter. Those Lambda SUVs from General Motors are incredibly heavy. The Buick version weighs almost 5,000 pounds. The difference is immediately noticeable out on the road. You don't get a lot of feel in any of the vehicles in this segment, but the Pathfinder certainly feels a little bit more nimble, a little bit more direct, and a little bit more engaged with the driver. Again, none of these vehicles feels like a sports car, and in general, the Pathfinder is kind of middle of the road, maybe towards the upper end of the middle of the pack. Something like a Kia Sorento or a Dodge Durango would actually be the better handling options in this segment, but this does handle better than any of the large entries in this segment. So in that respect, the handling is very good because there are very few things this size that handle this well. Weight also plays a big role in fuel economy, and in real world driving, I've been averaging about two miles per gallon better in the Pathfinder than in the Chevy Traverse all-wheel drive. That may not sound like a lot, but when you're going from, say, 18 miles per gallon to 20 miles per gallon average, you'll actually save quite a bit. The Dodge Durango is one of my favorite vehicles in this segment because of what's going on under the hood. The Durango is a rear-wheel drive crossover. It's not a traditional SUV like the Chevy Tahoe or the Chevy Suburban. It actually is a unibody vehicle that happens to be rear-wheel drive. It's somewhat distantly related to the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, and you get V6 or V8 engines under the hood and an 8-speed automatic transmission. You also get an absolutely excellent weight balance. Now, on the downside, we get a much longer hood for a vehicle that's really not that much different in terms of size. The deal with that is that you get less room on the inside. So the Dodge Durango is much more fun to drive. It actually is almost perfectly balanced in terms of weight distribution in the V6 model. It's a hoot and a half to drive out on the road but it's just not as practical on the inside as the Pathfinder. The difference is most noticeable back there in the third row and in the cargo area where you will find more practical real world room than the Durango. If I were shopping for a Pathfinder, I think I would land right at the SL Premium or the SL with the Tech Package. The SL with the Tech Package gives you the navigation system, the up-level Bose sound system, as well as the all-around camera, and the Premium Package gives you the panoramic sunroof option. All-wheel drive is just under $1,700, and that is an option that I would buy in the Pathfinder. It doesn't really decrease fuel economy too much, and as far as all-wheel drive systems go, it's actually a decent price. As often happens, I've saved the trickiest comparison for last, and that is the Infiniti QX60. That's the video you're seeing right now on your screen as well. At $42,400, it's not really that large of a bump over top-end trims of the Pathfinder. You get the same convenience on the inside, you get the same ability to have that child seat strapped into the second row and easily hop into the third row. The cabin has more polish on the inside with better quality materials and real wood trim. You also get a longer warranty on the Infiniti. That's of course before you even factor in the value that you may or may not find in a luxury brand versus a mass market brand and I think the better looks on the Infiniti as well. On the downside, of course, you do end up paying more for the Infiniti. Once you back out that longer warranty, you're still gonna pay about a $2,000 premium. However, that still means that the QX60 is one of the better deals in this segment because the Nissan is already one of the least expensive entries in the segment, feature for feature. So the Infiniti QX60 has a very good value proposition for itself up against top-end trims, especially hybrid trims, of the Toyota Highlander. Speaking of hybrids, if you want to know more about the Infiniti QX60 hybrid, just go ahead and click on that video right there on your screen. It'll be taken on over to that review, and you can see what the upscale version of the Nissan Pathfinder is like. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2015 Nissan Pathfinder. Go ahead and click that subscribe button at the bottom of your screen. You can also find me over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, over at twitter as alexnautos, and I'll see you next week. Far as away, a candle's fickle flame. I think I held you yesterday, our love was just a game. Tell me that you love me so, you tell me that you care, but when I need you, baby, you're never there. The time to get to know me, find me, want me, why can't you just show me?